thank you. All right. Well, we're continuing our series, and uh, we come today to one of these tough, naughty subjects, as you can see it up uh, up there on the screen. Um, divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Uh, I heard about a man who who died and went to heaven, and uh, he saw two lines up there. And at the end of the line, down through there, he could see an angel at a desk. But he, he had took him a while, and he he thought, well, I'm, I got to pick one or the other. So uh, one one line had a sign over it that said predestined, okay, and the other one had a sign over it that said free choice. So being a good Calvinist, he got in the predestined line, okay. And he waited patiently and he worked his way to the front of the line and he got to the angel there at the desk who was in charge and, 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 and the angel asked him, why are you in this line? He said, well, I, I picked this line. He said, are you sure? And the man said, yes, um, I'm sure um, I, I chose this one. And the angel said, well, you're in the wrong line. You need to go over there to the free choice line. And so, okay, he, he, fr he was frustrated and he got out of his predestined line and he went over to the free choice line and he worked his way to the front and the angel in charge asked him, why are you in this line? And the man said, well, somebody higher up over there made me get in this line. <laughs> Think about that and you'll get it here in a minute, okay? <laughs> God's sovereignty and man's free will in salvation. It's probably the oldest theological debate um, that's been around. It's been going on for hundreds, if not, you know, a couple of thousand years. You know, how does that work? That there, that there is a God who is absolutely sovereign, in charge, in control of everything, and yet he made us with a free will and responsible to him. How does that work? How does that come together? And, you know, the short answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it is a mystery. It is a mystery to, 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 to me, anyway. But there are smarter people than me who profess to know. And we're going to understand and we've been talking about one of those people who's smarter. Uh, his initials are JC, and no, it's not Jesus Christ, right? It's John Calvin. And, and there are people who, you know, who think they know how it's supposed to work out, though he does talk a lot about mystery, to be fair. Can you, but, can you get a perspective about when mm -hmm. John Calvin was right when, this, uh -huh. when he came to this conclusion, like what timing and what, I mean, as yeah. as a... 1530s, 1530s, um, his, his conversion experience around the 1530s, and he wrote um, up to about 1560, and, and uh, wrote his, uh, his Institutes of Christian Religion, which is his major contribution, although he wrote all kinds of sermons and commentaries on lots of stuff, but his Institutes of Christian Religion, it was revised about three times, and that is the major work that all the Reformed theologians go to. Um, and, and we're going to talk a lot about him and where he got his ideas, which I think are the key to understanding the faulty foundation that is Calvinism. And, and we'll get to it, but but there are a lot of people who think they've got this worked out right here. They, they think they've got it wired. And, uh, and we're going to look at four, not this week, next week, four different perspectives on how those two things work together. Divine sovereignty and human responsibility. And one of those is the Reformed Calvinistic perspective. Uh, and that's the one we'll focus mainly on, but I want to give you the four so you've got a broad look at the four main ones that are out there. Um, and Southern Baptists kind of oscillate a little bit between them. But anyway, let's look first of all, though, that, you know, as you look at the fact that the Bible, let's talk about what the Bible says, because that, that's how we've been doing this study. We've not been looking at systems yet, though we're about to. 
okay? I'm, I'm fixing to unleash <laughs> on the systems, but we've been looking at what the Bible teaches because I think that's the way to approach theology, doctrine. You look at what the Bible teaches and then you look at the systems, the doctrines of men. Most people do this study the other way around. They will take you to the system, you know, T-U-L-I-P, which is what we have identified as Calvinistic, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints, and then they'll say, okay, what scriptures match up with those? No, 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 no. No, that's not how you do proper biblical theology. You look at the text first, and then you evaluate what people say about it. That's how we're doing this, okay? Completely different approach. And I know it's completely frustrated my sweet wife to death because as she says, I've not only told you what time it is, and I've not only built you a clock, I've built Big Ben <laughs> in London in doing this. So my apologies for doing that, uh, but, but I really want you to be equipped because this is the threat to traditional biblical Southern Baptist doctrine that exists in our Southern Baptist Convention today, of which this church is still, as of today, a part. Okay? So, let's look at it, the, what the Bible teaches. And, and obviously, the Bible presents a very strong concept of God's divine sovereignty over the world and human affairs, but at the same time, it presupposes human freedom and responsibility. And any teaching that rejects either one of those is, it's off, right? Um, and any view that respects biblical teaching has to account for both truths at the same time and somehow they're held in tension uh, with one another. They're not contradictory, even though they seem like they are but they got to be held in tension. So let's look first of all at the biblical data regarding divine sovereignty, okay? And the first point that I want to make, and, and by the way, I, I want to say right up front, because I like to give credit where credit is due, uh, most of this is, uh, that I'm giving you, these categories, are coming from this book. D.A. Carson, who is a Calvinist, but an honest one, uh, has written a book called Divine Sovereignty and Human Responsibility. Okay, and he only really, um, this, this comes from most of what I'm going to give you today, comes from his Old Testament survey. He doesn't do the whole Bible, he just does the Old Testament, does John's writings and a few other things. But, but anyway, it's a great book if you want to look at the problem of these two things together. How do they work out? Um, and obviously, I don't agree with everything he says, right? <laughs> I've already made that clear. Uh, but I do want to give... Uh, and, and the first point that he makes is that God is the creator, possessor, and the ruler of all. He made everything, right? I mean, we know that. And he made it good. And he's the possessor, since he's the maker of all things, right? He, you know, as God says, the silver's mine, the gold is mine, and the, and, and the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. You know, everything belongs to the Lord. He's the possessor of it. So, that being the case, he's God. He's in charge. Uh, nothing's too hard for him. Nothing's impossible for him. He's sovereign over all the earth, and he reigns over all the nations of the earth. And, you know, that's the point of, of the book of Daniel and all these interchanges with Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 2 and 4 and 7 and 11 and 12. I mean, there's, God is in charge of the nations and what's going to happen with the nations all the way to the end of time. He's got it all planned out. And to God, the nations are nothing. Right, he weighs the, the hills in, in, a, in a scale, and the mountains in a balance, and the nations are kind of you know, sitting on the circle of the earth. Isaiah 40, and they're like a grasshopper to him. He says, you know, the Bible <laughs> about God looking at the nations and the rulers are less than nothing. Uh, but he rules in the kingdoms of men. He he raises up kings. He puts down kings. We know that, don't we? Uh, so he's the creator, the possessor, and the ruler of all. And he calls up peoples to operate 
Um, and he uses them as instruments, sometimes for punishment. In the cases that you've got up there on the screen, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the, the Philistines, all these folks uh, that God has raised up to punish Israel. But then others, he raises up to help, doesn't he? Help Israel. And of course, immediately it comes to mind, you know, Cyrus letting the people of Israel go back to the Promised Land and rebuild the city of Jerusalem and rebuild. Uh, you know, the walls with Nehemiah and the temple with Ezra, right? So God calls, calls all these nations onto, onto the human sta uh, world stage and um, he causes them to uh, do his bidding, his will. So, I mean, a very strong sense of God's sovereignty. And, of course, God's the judge of these people, all people uh, and nations. Um, He's not only all-powerful, he's all-knowing. And his omniscience is often associated with his judgment. And when he pronounces judgment, nobody can stay his hand, the Bible says, right? Very strong sense of God's sovereignty in the Scriptures. And not only that, but even your breath, the Bible says, is controlled by God, right? <laughs> and if he took it away, we'd all die. Um, and then all of our, our days are numbered, the Bible says, right? According to the scriptures. And, of course, when you read the book of Job, I mean, it's real clear and elsewhere. Uh, God's in control of all the weather and the forces of, quote, nature or creation is a better word. Uh, everything, everything is under the control of God, according to the scriptures. And... Even chance events are not apart from God's direction. Um, you know, even the lot is used. You know, the holy dice that we talked about a couple of weeks ago with 1 Samuel 23. Uh, even the lot, when it's cast, is under God's control. What is it that the, the Proverbs 16.33 um, uh, the lot falls in the lap, but God could, God is in control of the outcome. Is that what it says? If I remember 1633. Um, so the, the lot falls in the lap, but God controls the result. I don't know if that's Kenan's own translation or if that's uh, maybe a more modern translation of that verse, but uh, you get the point. Uh, so... Even the chance events are not chance events. Nothing's random. God's in charge of all of it, according to what some scripture, you know, some of these scriptures say. And, such, and with such sweeping sovereignty, uh, God makes these predictions about the future, and His control is, you know, you can't really distinguish about the, between the predictions and His control over what's going to happen. I mean, it's just like one and the same. Uh, it seems to be when you look at, at scriptures that, that I've got listed here. Um, so you've got, you've got a lot of biblical data that's come at you with this one. Let me give you one more here. The, the, the rule of God overall assumes his providence. And we've talked a lot about that with American history, that they looked at what happened with the war for independence in Great Britain as God's providential intervention into human affairs on behalf of the colonies to help us win our independence. And they had that same sense in the Old Testament, that God's in charge of all this stuff. He's helping us, right? And as Proverbs puts it, the Lord has made everything for its purpose, and even the wicked for the day of trouble. So here's the second point. That, does that make sense so far? Uh, you, your eyes might be glazing over just a little bit, uh, but I mean that this is I mean this is really strong affirmation of what God how God is in charge. Um, God is the ultimate personal cause of everything. Uh, you know, for example, when people have babies, it's like the Lord's doing. <laughs> you know, according to the scriptures, God gives children, uh, and and they're a gift from God, right? Uh, and then when Joseph's brothers, uh, you know saw the money in their sack, they thought, well, God did that, right? It was the Lord doing it. God, according to um, Miriam, as she's singing the, singing the song, you know, uh, after uh, the uh, Pharaoh's armies are overwhelmed with the waters, you know, 
and they're they're looking back and they're realizing that God took off the you know even took the wheels off the Egyptian chariots and 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 they you know ran into each other and they couldn't escape and the waters you know overwhelmed them and then uh, Miriam you know leads the song of praise to God who made all that happen right um, and then thirdly God elects or selects people for his purposes now I know we talked about election and we talked about it from the corporate angle we talked about the fact that God chooses a people and your choice of Jesus puts you in that group of elect people okay and we talked about that corporate election and that's the antidote to Calvin's you know particularistic individualistic election from the foundation of the world to be saved or lost without you even being born you know that that's the answer to that and we talked at length about it but the fact remains that when you look at the scriptures there's not only that corporate election that I've taught you taught you out of Ephesians chapter 1 there is a specific election that happens God chooses people in the Old Testament for particular purposes for service okay where whether we could even talk about Cyrus you know being raised up by the Lord uh, as being elect in a sense to not for salvation purposes but to help the Israelites get them back to the land and help them along their uh, purpose of trying to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the temple so God does select individuals um, and, and so let me just go ahead and get started with it here God elected Israel as his chosen people obviously to be a blessing to the nations a light to the Gentiles and that election is based on two complementary acts one the choosing of Abraham remember he selected him out of all the people of the earth right and then the exodus secondly where God pulled them out of the land of Egypt which he said he would do he said they'd be there 400 years so the, the you know sins of the immorality of the Amorites was full so he brought them out of Egypt and brought them to a land to be their na their national home and that land is I mean it's still there I mean and, and God still has that intention and so in other words his election his calling is something that you just can't do away with it's there um, and that's Paul's point in Romans 9 to 11 which we'll get to that you know the, the the guy that he's arguing with Paul in Romans is well are you saying then since the people of Israel mainly just rejected Jesus when he came are you saying that we're out now he's saying no not at all <laughs> there's still opportunity for Israel to be saved because there's a covenant that God made with his chosen people whom he elected right and so though Abraham is chosen now notice this though on the flip side not all of his offspring enjoy the same privilege Isaac is chosen but Ishmael is not Jacob is chosen but Esau is not to get the you know to be the one to carry on the the birthright the line the blessing goes through these people Isaac and Jacob not Ishmael and Esau now they get blessings of their own right God blesses them no question uh, Esau ends up being the father of the Edomites right Ishmael ended up causing lots of trouble the people from 9-11 are from Ishmael <laughs> you know but God did say he's gonna have the you know these blessings out there um, so but but there is a, a special choice that God put on these people uh, to serve in a particular way. And even within Israel, uh, it's God who chooses these leaders that we see. God, God picked out Moses, you know, with that burning bush. He's out on the backside of the desert. God speaks to him. He didn't speak to anybody else that way. And he picked him to lead the people of Israel. Uh, he picked Aaron the priest, he picked the Levites, he picked Joshua, he picked David, he picked you know all these people to serve, the prophets of course. Jeremiah said, I've known you before you were even born and I've consecrated you to be a prophet. So God does pick and choose and elect specific individuals for purposes for service. Okay, 
Now that's different from salvation. Uh, let me kind of tease that out a little bit. Um, because that's where the Calvinists will take you. Uh, the Calvinists will show you all these scriptures like I've got up on the screen and say, therefore, God chooses you in the same way to be either like Jacob or like Esau. Do you understand? So they take this and logically go to the next step of salvation, but that's not what this is about. Okay, You have to understand that. And that, that's We'll get to that later, and I'll explain it. But this is, this is where they're coming from. Okay, They'll take stuff like what's on the screen right now and take you down the wrong road by using logic, but not using the full counsel of God as the way to figure this out. All right, let me keep going here. Now, the election of Israel doesn't lapse when they disobey God. Right? I mean, they do. They turn away from it. Because there's always going to be a remnant who does obey God. And in fact, when you go to Romans 9, 10 and 11, Paul talks about the fact that not all who are from Israel are Israel. Because there are people like him who have come to know Christ out of Israel. So there is a remnant, right? And, and, we, and we see that uh, in, in Scripture, all kinds of places. When we, Like, for example, when Elijah's whining to the Lord saying, yeah, I'm the only one left, you know, Lord, just take my life. I just want to die. And he says, no, I got 7,000 people who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. I got a remnant out of Israel. Now, there's a bunch of people gone off the rails. King Ahab and his crazy queen being among them. <laughs> But, you know, Jezebel, but there's 7,000 who are obeying me, right? And so there's a remnant. And because, uh, you know, this covenant that God made with them uh, there at Sinai, um, election and the covenant, the, the expectations God have overlapped, uh, they overlap, but it's really the remnant that is true Israel. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans 9 to 11. And you have to know that as a background. So, um, the elect, this remnant, uh, is a smaller group uh, than all the people who, you know, say they are a part of Israel. And it's really only those people who enjoy the new covenant that, uh, where God says, I'll take out that heart of stone and I'll put in you a heart of flesh, right? And I'll cause everybody to obey my law because I'll put my spirit in you. You know that scripture, right, from Jeremiah? Um, and then only this smaller group of faithful, righteous people are truly the elect. So you see already that even though God chooses a people Abra through Abraham, Israel, that even within that people, what are the people who are truly the elect ones? The ones who believe and obey not just because they were picked, selected, and chosen, but because they responded with faith and obedience. Now, that's how you break the stranglehold that they've got on these texts right there, is the fact that the remnant has characteristics that are different from the whole. Right? Okay. Now, I know, again, I'm getting weeds here, really, with you, but I think this is important to understand. And this is a Calvinist guy that's presenting this, by the way, in this book. He's a Calvinist, but he's honest. And they're not always honest, <laughs> these Calvinists. They want to find their proof text, beat you to death with them, and not tell you that there's another way to look at it. But this guy does, so I give him credit for that. And there are some who do, just to be fair. So... Um, now, here's the thing that they like to talk about. Because there is, you know, election of a people, Israel, then that means that the reverse is true. That God chooses some people for special blessing and favor and, you know, his love and, 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 and all of that. Uh, the reverse side of that is the reprobate. Okay, now, that, now we're getting into what 
where, where we've talked about some are chosen for salvation and others are chosen for damnation. Some of the Calvin quotes I've shown you. Okay, And in the Old Testament, you do see some sense in which God raises people up to use them for, for a purpose, okay? And, and, and the purpose is to judge them, and the purpose is to glorify himself. And for example, let's talk about Pharaoh for a second. And again, he's a big part of Romans 9 to 11, Romans chapter 9 in particular, uh, where the Calvinists will take you and beat you to death with the fact that God raised up Pharaoh just to destroy Pharaoh. He's a vessel of dishonor, and there are people that God has chosen in this world to be like that. But now hold on for a second. Now the Bible says many, many times, eight times for example, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Remember? Moses went to him, let my people go, but the Bible says God hardened his heart purposefully so that he would not, so that he could do what? Do these ten plagues, judge Pharaoh and, and Egypt for the sins that they had committed against God's people and the sins they had committed against God in worshiping all their false gods. God did that for a purpose, right? So that he, his glory could be manifested, that he is superior to the Egyptian gods. Right, so there's a big picture involved in here, not just God and Pharaoh having it out. Understand? All right. So, but here's the flip side of this deal that you need to understand too, and the Calvinists will never tell you this, not unless you press them. And that is the fact that he hardened his own heart a bunch of times. So what I want to say is is that God didn't just take this innocent bystander, Pharaoh, oh, he's the nice guy. You know, all things being equal, he, he could have been one of the elect. No, 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 no. No, he's a sinner. He's evil. He has enslaved God's people. He's an idolater. And God simply took what was already in his evil heart and just intensified and calcified it. He hardened his own heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Calvinists will tell you, oh no, he just picked this guy and he hardened his heart because God just kind of capriciously does whatever he wants to on people, you know, operates on their emotion and their will and just takes them however he wants to take them, just makes them like robots and that's just how it is. Oh no, he was already this way, okay? You understand? Now, I didn't even give you all the scriptures. I think it's seven times, maybe eight times, uh, that it says he hardened his own heart. I didn't give you all the examples. Um, but we also read that he did it for a purpose. Now, let me keep going. Now, the uh, uh, hold on. Double slide there. All right. Now, God also gives the command... And this is through Isaiah uh, that you know you need to make these people that you know make these people insensitive, make their hearts hard, their eyes dull, or their eyes dim, and their ears dull. Remember that scripture, and Jesus even quotes that in Matthew 15. And yet they presuppose that they're already deserving of judgment because of their actions. So, in other words, the people that God says. I want you to, to make it so they don't even listen to your message, Isaiah. I don't want them to, I don't want, you know, I, I want their ears stopped up, their eyes dimmed so they can't see the truth, and their hearts hard. Well, the assumption is, why? Because they've sinned to the place that it's like Paul said, their conscience is seared like a hot iron. They can't even respond anymore. And they just need to be judged as a result. So, um, again, this guy's honest. Most Calvinists would just give you the first point, right? They wouldn't give you the second. And here's the last point, because this is what people miss completely who argue this type of stuff. And that is, God is consistently saying, don't harden your heart. Come to me, you know? 
and I'll forgive you. So, all right, that's number three. Number four, um, God punishes people for failing to acknowledge Him. And we see this very clearly in Scripture. Um, you know, because God made Pharaoh great, he thought he'd done it himself. God says, I'm going to bring you low. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar, big example, right? Where he ends up, uh, you know, he, it, the Bible says he, he was lifted up and he thought he had done all this great, all this great and mighty things and built his own kingdom. And God says, well, okay, I'm going to make you like, you know, one of the cattle in the field. You're going to go eat grass for a while. His, his nails grew out like talons and his hair grew out like somebody in an 80s hair rock band okay <laughs> and so he was <laughs> he went crazy he went insane for a while because God said you didn't acknowledge me because I'm the one that helped you do all that stuff right so God punishes people for failing to acknowledge him and so you know again when people do that it's not real independence from God uh, but really overt rebellion um, and, and that, don't, that doesn't work. And so the, the absoluteness of divine sovereignty and the reality of human responsibility really meet at that point uh, that we, we've got to acknowledge that. And we've got to acknowledge it with humility. Okay? All right. So that's divine sovereignty. Um, let, me, let me quickly run uh, through. There's ten of these. Human responsibility. Um, obviously, when you look at the scriptures, people are constantly being commanded to do stuff, right? <laughs> God says, hey, obey me, right? <laughs> um, and so from the very first prohibition in Genesis, through commands to individuals like Noah to build an ark, or Abraham to, you know, get up from your country and your kin and go to the land I'll show you, uh, you know, whatever it is, um, human responsibility is presupposed. The people have the option to obey or disobey God. So there's human responsibility. There's freedom involved in that, right? And then, for example, I mean, you, you've got all kinds of detailed uh, you know, instructions for how to, how to do worship, how to do the tabernacle, I mean, to the very dimensions God wants things to be built, the ark, whether or that, the ark or the ark of the covenant, doesn't matter. Uh, God gives these sweeping uh, commandments that he, uh, that he tells, tells his people that, that they are to obey. And then these requirements touch all of life so that they would be a unique and a special and a holy people, right? And uh, certainly these, you know, these commands um, in, involve a, a lot of detail. There I am repeating the same slide again. But people are, are told there's to seek the Lord, right? And the tabernacle itself was established and the temple itself was established as a place where they would meet God. And even after they'd rebelled against God, they would find Him again when they would seek Him. Second Chronicles 714, if my people are called by my name. Right before that it says if, if you get in trouble, you're taken off to a foreign country because you've been judged, if you'll turn your face toward Jerusalem and if you'll seek me, you'll find me, right? And, and God has only good for those who seek him. And I love what King Asa was told by the prophet. The Lord is with you while you're with him. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. That's human responsibility and freedom right there, isn't it? There is no question about it. God doesn't decide for you what you will do when it comes to his commands. He expects you, because he's given you the freedom, to make the right choice. Right? It, it seems very simple to me. I know. It does to you too. But there it is. Um, Secondly, people are said to freely choose, believe, and obey. God may choose Abraham and promise him blessing, but Abraham is the one who believes the promise and it's credited to him as righteousness. He's the one who obeys God's voice when he says, take your son to Mount Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice, right? Um, and in the Exodus, the Israelites agree to be obedient. They get to Mount Sinai, they see the, th the lightning, they hear the thunder, they hear the blast of the trumpet and the voice of God, and they said, yes, we'll obey you. Because <laughs> they were scared not to. Don't touch the mountain lest you die, right? <laughs> so they agree to be obedient. 
And the Israelites, of course, are, are chose to choose God, Yahweh. Uh, you know, as for me and for my house, we'll serve the Lord. You choose this day whom you'll serve, Joshua said, right? Uh, and there are two ways set before the people. Verses, two chapters of the Bible. Uh, three chapters, 28, 29, and 30 of Deuteronomy. Lay out those choices. It's very clear. There's a way that brings life, and there's a way that brings death. There's a way that brings blessing, and there's a way that brings curses. And you've got the choice between those two. And then, of course, in human relationships, there's always the freedom of choice as well. Um, and so that always uh, presupposes human responsibility and freedom. But the fact is, and we all know, that people sin and rebel. And this is not on God. It's not laid on God, is it? The fact that in Genesis chapter 3, his two kids decided they'd listen to the devil instead of him. God is not responsible for sin. And yet that is exactly what the Calvinists ultimately believe. Because they believe that God meticulously determined every event that is going to happen, every decision that you're going to make, including the decision to sin. No. God carved out of his sovereignty enough freedom to allow you to make the choice, and when you did, it's on you. Right? And you see it all throughout the pages of Scripture. Uh, that God, you know, is even sorry that he made man because the heart, the, the intents of, you know, the imagination of his heart is on evil continually, the Bible says, Genesis 6, 5. And the people corrupt themselves and the people do what is right in their own eyes. And so as a result of that, what happens? God holds us accountable because we are accountable. He didn't make us sin. We sinned on our own. And so as a result of that, God judges us, Right? That's what the Bible teaches. And his judgments are not always immediate. Sometimes the end of time is in view. In fact, the scriptures even teach that. That sometimes you're not going to be punished immediately, you're, but you'll get it in the end, right? At the end of the days when Jesus comes back. And then he tests people. Um, he tests people uh, to see whether they are going to believe in him or trust in him and obey him or, or not. And remember Abraham passed the test and Hezekiah didn't pass the test. And as a result, he brought judgment on his nation. Now some of these tests spring out of God's discipline on sin uh, that's already been committed by the people. Um, but then um, other tests are directed toward you know, individuals, sometimes toward the entire people. And, uh-oh, there we go again. I keep duplicating slides. Well, the blessing of Abraham, of course, he, he did um, obey God, and people receive God, and they get rewards from him. Uh, the midwives, uh, of course, feared God, didn't listen to Pharaoh. They were blessed as a result. And the people are assured that if they'll obey, uh, they'll see God's glory. If they keep the law, they'll live. And Caleb, of course, is picked out and selected. He says, you're not going to die with the rest of the generation. I'm going to let you live through the wilderness, and I'm going to let you get into the promised land because you have obeyed me. And so there was a reward for his obedience. Um, now, let's keep going here. I think this thing died. Human responsibility may arise out of God's initiative. Um, and again, the prophets make this clear. God elected and chose his people. But with that choice and with that election come responsibility, right? Demands. The covenant has demands to it. Um, and the responsibility that uh, Israel faces is not so much from God's choice of the nation as from that allegiance that is entailed by the election. So once the law is given, allegiance to God and the requirements of the covenant, basically one and the same thing. If you don't obey the law, then that means that you're not loyal to God. That's what's up there on the screen. And then here's another one. Uh, the fact that prayers are not just robotic recitations that God put in your head 
But prayer is real. It's visceral. It is actual. These are the cries of people who have free will before God. And when you look at some of the stuff that they ask for, I mean, I think of, what is it, Psalm 137, where, where David prayed that God would literally destroy his enemies and even, one of the verses says, dash the little ones against a rock. That is not a prescriptive prayer that we should follow. Okay? We should not be taking little babies and, you know, crushing them against a rock. Okay? Not a prescriptive prayer, but it is very descriptive of the cry of a sinful heart that is free before God to express the dark night of the soul that he was going through at that time. And, you know, some of these prayers are, are, are well planned and, and intense and others are, you know, answer, some are answered positively, others are just categorically denied by God. Uh, because they're just out of bounds um, and so but prayer is real and then God utters pleas for repentance he is constantly begging the people to return to him which presupposes what he's not making them do what he wants them to do <laughs> they're not doing what he wants them to do okay but the Calvinist says, oh, but you're denying the sovereignty of God because God is omnipotent and all-powerful. Yes, He is. But He's created a universe that carved out of that omnipotence and sovereignty a spot for us to say yes or no to Him. That's what they can't get. They got this, this uh, God that is a two-dimensional God that chooses this one and not that one and blesses that one and not that one when he's a three-dimensional relational God who has created us with the ability to make choices and unfortunately sometimes we make the wrong ones we sin and that's why he's calling for us to repent and come back and he wants us to avoid the consequences of judgment right and when he does afflict his people, it's unwillingly. He doesn't want to. You know, why will you die, O house of Israel? That's what these verses say. And even, you know, when all due allowance is made for anthropomorphisms, again, this is a Calvinist talking because he's, they basically claim all this stuff is just made up God in the human language. He really isn't that way. Well, yes, he is because he has a heart that beats for us that pleads with us to come back to Him, right? And uh, he, he is merciful, and He is patient, and He is long-suffering, and He wants us to come back. And here's the last one. i gotta, I got to quit. But here's, here's a big thorny one for those guys. <laughs> and that is when people repent, God changes His mind. Now, the Calvinists will quickly say that's just an anthropomorphism. God doesn't change his mind. And there are times in the Bible that say that, you know, he does, you know, he repents, he, not of sin, obviously, but he changes his mind uh, that he's about to do in the, something in the future. But it also says that he won't repent. He's not a man that he should repent. But again, we are confusing the language there, repent, what it means. One is talking about us and sin, and the other is talking about God and his mind, what he's decided to do in reaction to what we're doing, whether we repent or not. Okay? And again, it, you know, even more important than what we're saying here is that God would be like a man if he repented of sin. But what we need to see is that God knows what's going to happen um, and he changes his mind not because he doesn't know what's going to happen in the future, but he's said to change his mind because he's in that loving relationship. And if people repent and return to him, then he says, okay, 
I won't execute the judgment I had planned for you. Does that make sense? It does to us because we don't believe the way they believe. <laughs> right? So this is, this is the kind of stuff that drives them crazy. Um, now, as an example, of course, Moses interceding uh, with, with God for, on behalf of the people. Remember, they worshiped the idols, danced around the golden calf naked, or naked, as uh, my papa used to say, naked. Uh, and, uh, but, but Moses pled with him, and God says it changed his mind. Uh, that he would, that he was just gonna, you know, he was gonna wipe out these people. Start over with Moses at first, and Moses says, "Look, no, uh, please, you know, for your name's sake, don't do that." And here's the famous love. They love Jeremiah 18, you know, the passage about the potter, quoted in Romans 9. You know, who are you, old man, to ask the potter, why did you make me thus? But look at that passage. The one that they magnify to say, look, God has made some vessels for honor and some for dishonor. He's chosen you to be saved and you to be damned. Look even within the passage on the potter that there's contingency. He says, the instant I speak, verse 7, concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, pull down, and destroy it. I've pronounced judgment on that nation. But if that nation against whom I've spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I thought to bring upon it. And the instant I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom to build and plant it, bless it, if it does evil in its then I will relent concerning the good which I said I would benefit it. God changes his mind, so to speak, in response to our response to his commands if we obey him we get blessing if we don't obey him we get judgment there is a give and a take of relationship because he doesn't want robots he wants people to willingly love him worship him and obey him and to do that he had to back off his absolute con meticulous control and determinism of everything to allow you to choose and that is what the Bible teaches now again where do those two things come together and overlap and how do they work out I don't know I don't know I'm not smart enough I don't think we'll, any of us will know till we get there and we see him face to face but what we can do is trust him we can trust him because this book is true and that relationship is real it's not robotic and for that, we can praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. Uh, Lord, lots of deep truths that we just breeze through today. But, Lord, so essential in our understanding of who you are and who you made us to be in the context of your divine sovereignty. Lord, we're just grateful that you're in charge and we're not. We're grateful that you know the end from the beginning. We're grateful that you raise up kings and put down kings. We're grateful for your control of all these things that we can't control. But Lord, we thank you that in the midst of you moving history toward an end, and in the midst of you moving people and circumstances and events to complete your purposes for your glory, that within all that context of your control, you give us freedom. You give us the ability to choose because you want a relationship with us that's real and not a sham. God, thank you for that. <laughs> wow, what a great privilege it is to be able to get to know you and to worship you 
and to obey you as the creator of all the universe. And the fact that you'd pay attention to us is amazing in and of itself. But that you would love us enough that in your plan and in your foreknowledge and in your predestination you would send Jesus, your son, to die on that Roman cross at the hands of sinful men, a part of your plan, that you would give us the ability to bail out of the judgment that's been pronounced over us because of our sin and that we could have that relationship with you is just an amazing thing and be your children even more amazing. Be adopted into your family amazing. God, thank you. We're blown away by that. And God, we worship you and acknowledge you as God. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.